So welcome back after this short break. Uh, the next speaker will be Jos Motsmans uh, from Belgium. And we invited Jos to uh, speak about um, the, the role of EPATH uh, in improving trans healthcare and also some of the findings from the uh, the FRA, FRA LGBT study, and uh, he just just happened to be in Sweden, so <laughs> we're so happy <laughs> that just could take the train from Uppsala and come here, and uh, yeah, so let's give him an applause. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina, for inviting me, and thank you all for being here. Uh, it's really my pleasure to come. Um, I happened to be at a conference yesterday. The European Political Research Association has a political uh, gender conference every second year. And it was the second time that we had an LGBTIQ session within this conference. So gathering scholars from different uh, countries coming together to talk about their research on LGBTIQ, which is, I must tell you, within the academic field, a minority within the minority. So people working on gender are already a minority, people working on LGBTIQ issues are even uh, smaller minorities. So it's, it's really a pleasure for us if we can come together and exchange experiences. And it is, uh, yeah, it's really cool that I can be here as well and talk with you. I'm really looking forward uh, to hear you and your experiences and your um, uh, input. So, as you might know, research on the fundamental rights of trans people is really in its infancy. So um, it's a slowly emerging field. We have seen a lot of research coming from the medical professions and coming from the legal professions, not so much from social science yet. So, but there is an international growing canon in trans research. So I'm really happy that to, to see this witnessing. I have been witnessing this throughout my career, career and I started in 2002 with my PhD in social science on trans issues. Uh, people told me, you are ruining your career. Nobody is interested in this stuff. Nobody cares. Yeah, you will not have a future within the academia. I was not interested in a future within the academia. I was interested in doing interesting stuff. So that's why I pursued it anywhere. And look, 10 years later, I am looked upon by some as one of the experts. So things can change rapidly. So always stick to your own personal goals, I would say. So um, besides being a social scientist and a researcher on trans issues, I'm also involved in EPATH. So I will also tell you a little bit about the story of EPATH, what EPATH is what EPAD is about and how it came about and what our plans are, especially in the issue of improving trans healthcare in Europe. So one of the reports you might know, which is a very uh, interesting report, uh, is a report published by the Fundamental Rights Agency in 2013 already. Um, they did a survey in the 28 European countries uh, because there were no data on the respect or the protection and the fulfillment of the fundamental rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender persons. So they launched in 2012 this European online survey of LGBT persons' uh, experiences of discrimination, violence and harassment. And the data were collected by Gallup, which is a uh, research institute, and together with ILGA Europe. And the main result report was published in May 2013 already. And you, this report is really interesting because it contains the responses of over 93,000 LGBT persons throughout 28 European countries, which is actually the largest data collection ever. And it compares countries on different issues, discrimination, violence, daily life, and so on. But uh, one of the main problems with this report is that they compare lesbian women, bisexual women, gay men, bisexual men, and trans people. So trans people are grouped together and trans people have no sexual orientation. Uh, a huge problem and they were uh, aware of that when the report came out and because a lot of the uh, results for trans people are twice or three times or four times as bad as the results for LGBT people, they decided to have a special report on the trans respondents only. And that's when they contracted me, so I did the analysis for the trans people and then 
uh, we had this report being trans in the European Union and it is a very interesting report, not because I wrote it, but because it's the first one, maybe also because I wrote it, it's the first one actually, which is such a, such a large data set of trans people. I mean, for me as a researcher, I have been doing trans research within Belgium. I am already very happy if I could gather responses of 200, 300, 400 trans people in a small country as Belgium. But because it's such a small group that uh, takes part in this service, uh, you never get to really analyze in depth the differences between trans women, uh, trans men, cross dressers, being female or male cross dressers, other gender variant identities. So there is not enough uh, respondents to be able to do statistical analysis. And I could do it with this report. So this report contains experiences of 6,579 uh, trans people, which is really until so far the largest data collection uh, in New Europe. So who are the people, who are the trans people that participated? So what we did is, or what the survey did, is they gave a, a certain list of identities that the respondents uh, were supposed to choose from. And um, these are uh, the, the categories that people could choose from. We regrouped them a little bit uh, based on um, uh, birth sex for trans women and trans men, putting transsexual men with a transsexual passed together in one group because we noticed actually the experiences and actually that group was the same. Um, but what you might see at the very bottom of this slide is that the largest group is actually the group identifying as queer or other. And the other box gave the people the opportunity to, um, to write themselves how they identified. And you have a long list of very variant identities, non-gender, bi-gender, gender fluid, gender queer, whatever you feel comfortable with. So this already is a very important finding, I think, that shows that the trans people or the trans communities are a very diverse community. Not everybody identifies in the same way, not everybody uses the same terminology. Uh, and it's very important to also have a look at the distinctions within the trans community and the differences within. And this is something that we don't often do. You also see the results uh, for different countries, and you see for your country, Sweden, or for the most people present here, uh, 370 trans people took part. Just to, to make sure that all the results in the report um, were analyzed using a weighting methodology. So it's not because there are many people from Germany that their experience is way uh, larger in the results. So it's, uh, statistically it was uh, equalized. So on average, characteristics of all the trans respondents in this survey, most of them were rather young. So seven out of ten respondents were younger than 40, which I think is something that we often see in trans communities that all the trans people are not so present anymore. In contrast with a lot of online survey where you see that lots of respondents are highly educated when they take par part in online surveys, this is not the case in this survey. So the respondents were just as well as often lowly educated or highly educated. So it was a very diverse public from uh, educational background. The majority of the trans people were single, so living alone without a partner. So this is something that is already an indication that w you know, some something that we should take care of. Because I think the the being lonely, or it's not because you live alone that you're lonely, but uh, the feeling of loneliness is something that we know from other research as a very um, uh, specific topic to take care of. Um, Trans people in this survey tend to fall into the lower income quartile, so they were living with less income compared to the other LGBT, LGB groups in the survey. The sexual orientation was very diverse. A lot of trans people are also gay, bisexual, or pansexual, or use other terms. Um, and they often live in the Europe. Yeah. Okay, uh, just a question about income, uh, because in the survey we, we did, since people are very young, uh, or below 40, uh, a lot of people are students and you don't earn a lot when oh you study. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So is that like, have you weighted that? Like Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We looked only those who were in the age of being possibly employed. We t took out people who are still in, in college or people who are students. 
uh, if you look only at the people aged 26 or older, it still holds. So the finding still holds. It's not because they were very young. And also the LGBT, uh, sorry, LGB respondents were rather young. So it's, it's uh, yeah, absolutely, it still holds. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the last finding I also think is very important because um, a lot of politicians when talking about legal gender recognition have a problem with the fertility issue of trans people. And this survey showed that, look, uh, trans people are already having children or living with children in a household. It's not something that they only do after a medical transition. So 60% at this moment was living in a household with, with children under the age of 18. So it's not something special. A very striking finding for me is that uh, almost half of the trans respondents were very close about their trans identity. So 45% was open to none or only very few family members. And you might say, okay, maybe because family, uh, it's a bit uh, difficult to be open about. But even towards friends, you see that almost half of the trans respondents were open to none or only just a few friends. We see that being open about, I mean, open is not like that you go out in the street and shout to everybody, I'm trans, but just, you know, talking about your close uh, social circus, about your, your identity or, or being able to live as, as you feel, it increases with age and it also increases with income, which is not so surprising, but it decreases with a higher educational level. So people who are highly educated are more close to buy their trans identity than people who are lowly educated. And I think it's my interpretation of the findings because we don't have any data to, to really support it. it. I think it has to do with the fact that if you have a high position in society because you have a highly educated background, that also you have maybe a lot to lose if you would come out, if you would be open about yourself, you might risk losing your job. And if this job provides you and your family with an income, and it, it provides you with an income that maybe enables you to undergo a medical transition if you wishes to do so. So these are all these kind of you know, situations that people are living in. The report contains a lot of information about discrimination. I'm just going to give you a few results about healthcare. And this is, this, th this slide is just the overall discrimination experience of trans people. So over half of all respondents said that in the year preceding the survey, they felt personally discriminated against or harassed because of being perceived as trans. So it don't even have to be trans, but being perceived as trans. And you see the differences for all the different uh, trans groups. So trans women were, uh, you know, reporting this the most often uh, compared to the other groups, uh, but also people who identify as transgender or trans men were very um, reporting very high numbers. And those who felt discriminated against or harassed, as a result, uh, start hiding their gender identity. So uh, because of this negative experience, they kind of conclude for themselves, look, it's too dangerous to be who I am, so I better shut up, hide, and not be open about me being trans. And you see that uh, differences are 60% versus 40% of people who avoid expressing gender. So it's the first group is the group who did not, uh, uh, who did experience um, uh, harassment or discrimination, uh, started uh, hiding their gender expression compared to the other group. Some findings for healthcare. Um, Around one out of five um, respondents who accessed healthcare services, and I must make clear that, of course, not all trans people do so, um, they had uh, discrimination experiences with uh, social services personnel or healthcare services personnel. And I just looked up for Sweden, and you see, actually, it, it's a bit higher than the European average. So a quarter of all trans respondents from Sweden reported having experienced uh, discrimination with healthcare services. Up to 30% of all respondents who sought help for being trans experienced a situation where a healthcare practitioner wanted to help but had no information on how to do so. So even when you have an encounter with a healthcare uh, personnel who is actually not negative, who wants to help you, this person not just does, is not informed, does not know where to refer you to and how to help you. So this, this finding is a very clear sign that within the education of uh, healthcare providers, and think about doctors, nurses, and other kind of medical staff, there is a clear need for training and education on trans issues. So that if they encounter uh, a person or client who comes forward with this 
demand or this question, they at least are aware of what this means, being trans, and what uh, the possibilities are in the country they're living in. And these findings are also a very sharp contrast with the recommendation of the Council of Europe, which calls member states to ensure that th there are the highest attainable standards of health that can be effectively enjoyed. So effectively, it must be able, you must be able to access healthcare without discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. And it explicitly mentions that transgender persons should have effective access to appropriate gender reassignment services. And any decisions limiting the costs covered by the health insurance for gender reassignment procedures should be lawful, objective and proportional. And of course, this is not the case in many countries. Looking more into depth about experiences with trans people in healthcare, you can see that uh, the uh, experience w are very high, like uh, inappropriate curiosity, going into the hospital because your leg is broken, and having nurses having nurses asking you questions about your genitalia, stuff like that. It happens. It's not, you know, it's not okay. It's not what trans people should expect when they go into hospital for non-trans related healthcare. Uh, when you have specific needs on um, trans care, that those needs are ignored or not taken into account, it happens too often. You see 17% of all trans people report this. And you see a lot of other difficulties that people had with trans care um, services. Um, we also saw that the number of trans respondents who felt discriminated against by this healthcare or social service personnel was twice as high as the resu results from the other LGB groups. So although LGB persons also have a lot of problems, trans people have twice as often these kind of problems. And this is a quote from a queer person uh, from Latvia who said that she has experienced communication with transphobic psychologists who think that her gender identity or her gender identity is a result of some kind of trauma. And nearly um and it is nearly an illness. And she, uh, she or he says, I do not think that it is an illness. I like my identity, I only do not like the reaction of society. And I think this is a very uh, clear um, testimony of, of experiences of a lot of people. And as a result, a lot of people go abroad for treatments. Uh, we see that around 8% says, yes, I have gone abroad for treatment, and especially people from Ireland were very high uh, in this uh, category. And 10% says, yes, I, I'm really considering to go abroad for treatment, uh, because in my country it's not accessible or it's not uh, the way that I would like to have it. And the results for each country, you can also look it up online. On There's a data tool explorer on the FRA website that you can have a look on. Uh, you can see that the differences for, actually for all kind of discrimination uh, that was uh, surveyed, the, dis the uh, differences for each country were very different. Uh, and it's also not always the same countries who are doing worse on different discrimination uh, experience. So it's also very varied in that uh, aspect. So. What needs to be changed? Trans people could say in this survey what they wanted to be changed. And you see a lot of things need to be changed. Uh, I think almost uh, all trans uh, persons were agreeing that these things have to be changed. And I think what's the most important coming out of the survey is that, of course, national having national authorities who promote the rights of trans people is, of course, something that almost all trans people are in favor of. Uh, having um, public figures in, in politics, business sport who come out as trans and having these role models, role models, these this open persons is very important. Measurements in school, in healthcare, in uh, the workplace is very, uh, very important. And in general, we saw that in the report that countries where there isn't equality policies for trans people, trans people are doing much better in general. So having a trans equality policy in your country is actually a very good idea. And to end this uh, presentation on, on the results of, of the, the survey, another quote from a trans woman of the Netherlands who says, as a transgender person, I really feel it's crucial that policymakers and healthcare providers understand that there are just uh, more than just two extremes of the gender spectrum. We need more understanding, but more importantly, more resources and legal support to live our lives equal to other people. 
and uh, I really urge you to go to the FRA website and use the Data Explorer tool and have a look at all the different uh, questions because I could not present because it's, it's a very large data set and you can have a look at uh, specific, you can compare LGBT persons, you can have a look within the trans uh, different identity categories, you can uh, really explore the data tool and, and even use the data for your own work. So then to the EPOT story. Because I was asked to, to tell you also something about the work that we are doing with EPAS. I'm not aware how many of you know about the existence of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. It's an association established a long time ago. Um, it's a world association that actually collects everybody working in the field of trans healthcare, whether they be psychiatrists, uh, surgeons, uh, social scientists, uh, uh, legal scientists, it's a very mixed, uh, diverse uh, group of professionals working in the fields promoting the health and well-being of trans people. And they have conferences every two years somewhere around the world. Uh, we were at a conference in Atlanta in 2011, and you must know that 80% of the members of the WPATH are actually US-based, so it's called World organization, but we saw that not many people from Europe are present within this association. They are not coming to these conferences, although if you look into the publications and into the research field, I think it's the other way around. 80% of all the publications is coming from Europe. So why do those scientists or clinicians are not coming to the World Association conferences? That was some one thing that we were uh, discussing in Atlanta. There have been a few attempts within Europe to have a European platform for trans uh, healthcare providers. There was uh, the first transsexualism meeting, it was called, in Italy in 2012. Um, and then a second meeting in Madrid, in Spain, in 2013. Um, but there was no continuation, so it was like this single attempt of some professionals wanting to do something within Europe. And we decided, um, okay, let's do something about it. Let's come together. And we had a meeting, a pre-launch meeting, we called it in Brussels, but uh, you see a lot of people from a lot of different countries. Um, and also together with uh, Transgender Europe, because from the start we thought it was very important to also work closely with uh, Transgender Europe, the European umbrella organization for all trans uh, activism. Uh, and we were discussing, okay, so what do we want and how do we want it? And we invited um, Gail, Gail Nutson from Canada, because in Canada there is something called CPATH, which is the Canadian uh, regional umbrella organization. And there is also something called ANSPATH, which is the Australian New Zealand uh, organization. And now some also Asia PATH is coming up. And there's also US PATH coming along. So there are different regional chapters at this moment being created. And so we decided, okay, I think it's really time for Europe to have an uh, EPATH, a European uh, association. And that's what we did in the next WPATH conference, which took place in Bangkok. And you can imagine Bangkok, who can, who can afford going to Bangkok as a social scientist, for instance. For me, that was really expensive. Uh, for doctors, that's something else sometimes. But anyway, this is already uh, one of the things, you know, traveling so far and making these expenses is really not so easy for many researchers, uh, even if you have a good uh, position within the academia. So we launched EPATH, or we announced EPATH, so to say, at the WPATH conference in Bangkok. And from the very moment, we got a lot of support by the board uh, of WPATH. They were really ve very enthusiastic about our idea. They invited us, they are uh, helping us, they are stimulating us. And so we came up with, okay, EPATH. Who are we? What are we about? So this is what we decided. We will focus on Europe, but not European Union only, but Europe as a, the continent, so more than only the 28 states. We are um, an association for professionals, meaning that everybody who is professionally working within the field doesn't mean that you have to be cisgender. It just means that you have to be professional. That can be anybody. So the professionalism stands for that we want an exchange of knowledge, an exchange of research, good practices also, because we notice in many, Euro many European countries there is no gender team or no gender clinic at all. 
Um, and if there is an uh, individual healthcare provider, he or she might need some kind of network to, to go to and to ask, you know, I have this client wanting hormones, but you know, what kind of products should I prescribe and how, how much doses should I give and what kind of control should I be doing to, to monitor the health of this, this person. So to have this kind of platform for professionals is very important. We use the term transgender but uh, meaning um, we use it as an umbrella term. So we want to be very inclusive of the very, very different gender identity um, categories. So be it transgender, transsexual, gender non-conforming, gender variant. I mean, for us, it's just, it's a label to describe that we are open for this variation. So this also means that if we're working on trans healthcare, we're working on trans healthcare for all trans people and not only those who fit the F64 uh, diagnosis. Um, and then the word health, very important. Um, with health, we mean physical health, mental health, but also social well-being. So we use here, or we follow the definition by the World Health Organization that describes health as the absence also of discrimination, violence, and harassment. So working towards uh, social well-being is very important. So this means that very different aspects and disciplines are involved. It's not just the doctors and the psychiatrists, it's also the legal scholars, the social scientists, and so on. The aims and goals of ePath, our aims are very easy or very, very clear. We want to promote the mental, physical, and social health of trans people in Europe. We want to increase the quality of life among trans people in Europe. And we want to ensure trans people's rights for a healthy development and well-being. And how do we want to do that? By to foster the European knowledge and the skills in transgender care. So this also means training, uh, medical training for certain disciplines where there is in some countries none. Um, we want to facilitate and extend the bonds between the European countries in transgender care. And we want to spread the results of research and experiences by publishing reports organizing scientific conferences and meetings and collaborate with international organizations who are having the same or related goals. So the last one is why we work closely together with Transgender Europe, of course. We have three uh, divisions within EPART. We have an academic division, a clinical division, and a policy division. So um, the academic division is more devoted towards this academic research. The clinical one is more into the, the professional work and the policy division is more uh, dealing with the health policies in different countries and also at European level. So, translating these aims toward a conference, because uh, we wanted to have a conference, that was also very clear from the beginning. So the years that there is no world conference, so every second year we would have a European conference. And so, translating these aims to a conference was a, was a very huge task but what we decided from the very clear uh, uh, from the very moment was we want to have plenary sessions that come back in every epath conference and these plenary sessions should allow us to uh, achieve our goals and our aims and one of the uh, first uh, plenary sessions is a session called Transgender Healthcare in Europe where we invite four or five countries to present how they are going uh, about with trans healthcare, how they are organizing trans healthcare in their countries. And this exchange between different countries is really very interesting for the medical practitioners who have no idea that in neighborhood countries it's going like that or that. So this, this kind of exchange platform is very interesting. And then we also have a, a second plenary uh, session, which is the year in review, where we ask for the different disciplines within EPATH to present what has been the major uh, new insights in research and in clinical practice of the last two years. So this means that everybody in the room, whether you're an endocrinologist, a psychiatrist, a social scientist, is listening to what has been achieved within the field of endocrinology, what is new within the field of law, what is new within social science. So they learn across disciplines, and this is very important for us, that it's not just you know your narrow-minded view within you know, mental health, I'm looking at it like this, but you also hear from social scientists, from legal scholars, what, uh, what's changing. 
another important thing that we did, oh no, I forgot one thing of the last slide, it's a public session. Um, we also want to have at least one part of the conference where it's open to the public and we invite politicians, we invite activists, we invite the general interested public to come and to listen to uh, different topics and have a debate with them. So it's uh, open to the public free of charge because we know that a lot of academic conferences are very close, very uh, inaccessible for many people, so we want to have at least a part of each conference which is open and where there is an exchange from you know, politics, research and activist perspectives. And we also started with an EPOT student initiative and this was an uh, initiative taken up by Jonas and Silvano from Germany uh, who are very young uh, PhD students themselves uh, working on trans healthcare and they said look we really need this kind of platform of exchange of young researchers. Um, we want to connect them and we want to provide opportunities to meet and to have uh, um, an exchange of our work or questions that we are dealing with and, and reaching out to those who are maybe considering doing research in trans health issues but are doubting because they don't have an academic uh, network and then there is now this student initiative. So those of you who are interested in doing research or who are doing research, I really urge you to take contact with Jonas and Silvano. They have a Yahoo mailing list uh, which is not accessible by the us older uh, <laughs> researchers. Uh, and I think if I, the latest news that I heard is that there are around 40 or 50 uh, researchers from Europe now on that mailing list exchanging their experiences and, and ideas. So this first conference that we had was in Ghent in, in March this year. We had actually to close down at a certain moment the enrollment for the conference. We never expected so many people to come. We thought if we would achieve uh, a public of 200 people, that would be already a, a huge success. And at 350, we had to close down the, in the enrollments because of security measurements of the building that we hired because we had some fire regulations that we had to take care of, so we couldn't have more people, which was actually a pity, because refusing people to come to a conference is not what you want to do. Uh, we had several parallel streams, so endocrinology, mental health, children and adolescents, social scientists, legal uh, sciences, uh, surgery, so all these kind of disciplines had uh, special workshops presenting uh, research and clinical practices. But we also had 13 interdisciplinary workshops where there was a lot of debate across disciplines on certain new topics in the field. We had a lot of posters uh, and we had this public session and we had an amazing group of volunteers from the trans community who were present to organize the conference uh, at SPOT and they, they were very very, very, very uh, good uh, to have them there and to have also the exchange between the local uh, trans activists and the international academic crowds. So. so we had a first conference and then of course <laughs> you start thinking, okay, so EPOT obviously is something that has success, but uh, what do we have to do now to make EPOS a very successful organization? And what we did is that we decided to have um, an interim board of EPOS. So I'm also a member of that board and you see the other names uh, on, on the slide. And the task of this interim board is actually to establish EPOS as an official international non-profit association. So that's what we are doing at this moment. We are writing our bylaws, we are organizing ourselves. We will probably have our official seat in Belgium because three of the members of the board are from Belgium. It's out of practical reasons. Um, and we will then try to make EPOS an established organization and we will have the first elections of the real EPOS board at the second EPOT conference in 2017. And this is a, a picture of the board after the conference, looking very, uh, very tired, but still looking fabulous, as uh, the president said one day. So uh, it's, it's a mixture of a lot of disciplines, a lot of experiences coming together and from different backgrounds. So that's, that's the, the story of EPOT. I really like you all to spread the word because I think EPOT is still in its infancy. Not everybody is aware of uh, EPOT. We have a Facebook page that you also can like and follow or you can visit our website, contact us uh, by email or contact the students initiative by email. And I invite you all to the next conference which is going to be taking place from 6th to 8th of April in Belgrade. Uh, so the, the aim of the EPOT conference is that we will travel throughout the European continent. So 
people who are not able to come to Belgium uh, because of financial or other reasons might be able to come to Belgrade and that's uh, one of the aims that we want to do. So thank you for your attention uh, and I'm really looking forward to hear and to learn from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jos. Uh, we have time for questions and answers um, for a few minutes, so go ahead. Hi, I'm Sudiris. I'm from Cyprus. Um, I wanted to ask you whether you know about the FRA um, survey, whether it was contacted for the whole of Cyprus? Because, as you know, it's the island is divided and there are like two different legal regimes. Yeah, um, the way that the survey was conducted was that um, it was an online survey accessible for everybody. So you, you had all different languages and uh, the word got out mainly through the LGBT organizations. So the LGBT organizations were very much involved in spreading the word, word and, and uh, making their members aware that there is a survey. So the organization in Cyprus, I'm not fully aware of the name of the organization, but if there is an organization, then of course they would have th had that information and it was the task of the organizations to make it public in their own country. So that's what happens. Um, and this also explains the huge differences in the amount of responses, of course, especially for the trans people. There are some countries where there is no trans organization. And of course, then you also only get 10, 15 trans respondents from that country in the survey, because it was not a survey done by the government, it was done by the social activists in, in the field. So if you don't have an organization, it was difficult to spread the word. So I'm not sure in Cyprus if there is an organization uh, for the different legal regimes. Uh, my name is Stanislav. Uh, I'm just interested in uh, one of the questions. I don't know exactly the answer and uh, I just want to listen to your mind about it. Uh, at the beginning you told that um, trans men and trans women haven't uh, sexual orientation. But um, I thought that it's not so because uh, I have uh, uh, one of my best friends from St. Petersburg and uh, um, she's a trans woman and um, um, she, uh, she was a man but uh, she changed uh, her sex uh, and uh, now um, she's like lesbian. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm interesting. Um, what do you think about it? Uh, is it possible for uh, trans persons to have a sexual orientation? Thank you. Okay, um, I think everybody has a sexual orientation, whether you be a cisgender or a transgender person. Only what changes the way that we label that, organ that sexual orientation. If this person used to live as a man, and I don't know if he th at that time was also oriented towards women, society would have called him a heterosexual man, right? And after transition, his or her sexual orientation has remained the same, namely an orientation towards women. But because of the sex or gender change, I should say, of course the society looks upon it now as a lesbian relationship. So it's just wording, it's labels, but of course, um, for most, th we know that from research, from for the most of the trans people, uh, sexual orientation sometimes shifts a little bit during the transition because it's a moment of, of exploring your identity and questioning yourself on different uh, aspects. But it very seldom it changes in, in a like black and white direction. So if you used to be born with a male body and raised as a boy being oriented towards girls, the chances that you would be a, a trans woman being oriented only towards men are very low. You might become a bisexual or pansexual or whatever orientation, or in most cases, the orientation stays the same. So this black and white changes is very, very rare. Um, but sometimes it's an opening up of perspectives. That happens, yes. Thank you. I have a question about EPOTH. 
or two questions actually. Uh, do you have uh, members from all the countries of Europe currently? And do roughly what fraction of, of professionals in uh, trans health are members of EPATH? Okay. Um, at this moment, EPATH does not have its own membership. So if you want, or if someone wants to become a member of EPATH, uh, we work closely with the WPATH. And actually, members from the WPATH who are from the European continent are members of EPATH. That's how it works now, because we, are, we have no official organization status yet. Um, what we n know from the membership base of WPATH is that after the conference, uh, I think around 20 to 30 new members from Europe became a member of WPATH because of the EPATH conference. We still think this can be increased and we are fully aware that a lot of countries who were not present at EPATH could be member of EPATH. So this is work that we have to do. So maybe in a few years time I'm able to answer that question. But at this moment I can only say that we had I think from 31 different countries people at the conference but that was much more than the differences in members of the WPATH. So there's still, I think, a lack of uh, people who are, are not a member of WPATH or who don't want to become a member of WPATH at this moment. And that's why I think EPATH as an as a in-between step is very important. But that's something we have to work on. Yeah. So at this moment, what, what we are doing is if people like you know of healthcare providers in countries where there is no official gender identity clinic or gender team or something. It's very, very interesting for us to hear about that and to provide us with names of people so that we can contact those people and inform them about EPATH and maybe that way create also for those people in that work a platform, a professional platform that they can uh, use for maybe uh, setting up a structure within their country, uh, having trans healthcare that is accessible for more than just a few people. So if any of you has names, it's very in interesting for us to, to hear about that. So you can always mail it to me. I have a question uh, about EPATH. And I don't know, in the Swedish perspective, we've had a bit of problems with the Swedish Association for Transgender Health, with a professional a part, like the people working in this field uh, have been pretty hard to influence and to... Um, is there's been a divide between activists and the professional uh, association. Um, and now it's becoming a bit better, but that's because of certain individuals working in the field. Um, so I wonder how do you work with this so you don't create a space where researchers only listen to other researchers and not to activists and actual people experiencing uh, the lack of transgender health care? Yes, absolutely. Um, very good question. I think that's one of the reasons why we involved Transgender Europe. Mm? Because we really think it's very important to hear voices, other voices, than only the voices of the established gender identity clinics that are very uh, out there and that we already know about. So we don't often know about other, other voices. And um, I think there's a huge task for EPATH uh, to inform uh, gender identity clinics around Europe, whether it be from Western Europe or Eastern Europe or whatever, it, it's not always the good, bad, divide in that aspect, um, about the right guidelines for trans healthcare. Uh, what we do is we, we do follow um, the SOC 7, so the standards of care from the WPATH, which are for many European countries uh, still uh, a utopia at this moment, eh? even though there is criticism on the stock seven and even though the stock seven can be improved on certain aspects, um, we still think that for many Europe European countries having a stock seven is like heaven, I mean, at this moment, because there is, there is nothing like that at all. So that's one of the things that we would love, love to do is to inform the gender, even the established gender identity clinics about the guidelines, about we are very aware that not every gender identity clinic follows those guidelines and having this discussion and also proved through research that following guidelines like SUC7 results in good trans healthcare is one way to talk with other researchers or clinical practitioners who are not following SUC7. So that's one of the things or a way to, to reach them, I think. 
So yeah, it's a, it's a challenge for EPATH, absolutely. Hi, uh, Bedros also from Cyprus. Uh, I'm wondering why intersex people are not mentioned anywhere. Good question. We had that discussion. Um, we decided very clearly not to work on intersex issues. Um, the reason for it is that um, from a professional perspective, intersex is a totally different discipline. It's a totally different um, medical uh, background and it's already um, at this moment um, so that at the European level there are networks and platforms for academics working on intersex issues. And we felt that if we would stick to trans, um, although there might be sometimes similarities, especially from legal or social uh, aspects, um, we already would have a handful of work with only the trans uh, issues. And we would, I think it would be become too complicated if we would also work on intersex. It would become a too huge a task at this moment. And I think there is already a kind of a, a professional network dealing with intersex. Uh, so that's why. I think you, s you see the same with, with the activists uh, organization uh, in the social movement. Transgender Europe is also not working on intersex, which doesn't mean that you're not following what's happening in the field. Of course you are, bec because there are similarities, but there is another organization uh, dealing with intersex on an international level, even from an activist perspective. So I think it's a bit the same. Uh, that you respect each other's work and, and you collaborate if, if there is a collaboration, a need for collaboration, but you stay also with, with your specialty. Yeah. Tomas from Hungary. Uh, hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, a question following on Carolina's. I mean, we know that uh, quite a lot of gross human rights violations happen from doctors and, uh, on trans people. Now, is there any ethical procedure in kind of not involving people uh, that, that do those kinds of violations in the work of EPATH or if they're, they, they're found out to do such practice to get rid of them from the organization or there is no such an, a procedure? Good question. Well, at this moment, um, I think it's one of the tasks of EPATH when we're setting up the organization to reflect on this topic. Like, okay, how will we deal? Because now at this moment we don't have memberships, so we can't kick anybody out, right? <laughs> but if we start having memberships, okay, what kind of ethical guidelines will we use for our memberships? And I think this is something also WPATH is, is reflecting and working on that, but from a world perspective. I think from a European perspective, it's something else. It's more concrete sometimes, dealing with our social health policies and stuff like that. So we definitely have to reflect upon it and, and, and have some procedure at place for if we are confronted with this kind of situation, absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely something that we know, it's on our agenda, but at this moment we don't have an answer yet. But it's a very good question and we will deal with it. Uh, I just want to raise the topic about intersex, that there are intersex people who are also trans, and you have to take this into account and like to make sure that there is access to healthcare that people want or access to not have healthcare that you don't want. Uh, so yeah, I think this this is an important uh, point. Absolutely. Um, but then the common demeanor is being trans. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you're intersex or not. No. Because you're trans, you're part of the trans scope. So that's if you would have a need for access to medical healthcare uh, because you have a, another gender identity and you want some medical procedures to be followed, then of course you fall within the scope of trans research and trans pr clinical practice. Yeah. yeah, but in many countries, this is a this is a that can like intersex conditions make your access to trans healthcare um, less. Like you you can't access trans healthcare if you're intersex in some countries. Well, from a medical perspective, if you have a diagnosis of some intersex condition, you're not considered to suffer from gender dysphoria. Huh? You're you're an intersex person or a person with DSD, as they call it. So, and then there are the DSD teams at place who are helping you. Like, for instance, in my country, if you are an intersex person, it's a totally different procedure than if you're a trans person. An intersex person doesn't have to have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to access trans healthcare. So there is, there is healthcare for intersex persons because they are intersex and not because they are trans. I mean, this is from our country, maybe not from, 
for all the countries, I'm fully aware, yeah. yeah. And I think this is exactly one topic that collaborating with movements or um, academic networks who are dealing with intersex people is important. If there is some common ground or is there some com common issues, of course you have to work together, but it's not the main scope of uh, EPATH. So if there are no more uh, questions, we very much thank you for coming here. Thank you so much. It's been really great to have you. And I hope you stay for the rest of the day. I will stay the afternoon, um, yes. And now we we'll take a lunch break for one and a half hours. So you have time to go out in the city and find something to eat. And we uh, meet up again at uh, 1.30 uh, here and see you in the afternoon. Thank you.